Good afternoon and thank you. It's great to be invited back to be part of this important CEDAR event and to join the very impressive lineup of speakers uh, that we have here today. I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on and in the spirit of reconciliation pay my respects to them and their elders both past and present. My role here today is to share some insights into the economic and political landscape from the perspective of the community services sector in Western Australia and the hundreds of organisations that make up the Council of Social Service here in WA. It is great to see CEDA continue to shine a light on the relationships between the economic, political and social conditions in our community. The Council always welcomes the opportunity to share and exchange research and ideas with other sectors and organisations, particularly those who are committed to improving public policy and getting better community outcomes. So I'm really pleased to be able to be here today. As you no doubt are aware, the sector is in WA are very diverse and provides a range of services from early childhood all the way through to aged care across the whole of our state. And our role in providing services, not just through our mission base, but also on behalf of governments, continues to grow. In fact, the sector continues to hold the place as the fastest growing sector in Australia and the second fastest in WA behind the resources sector. Demand for its services also continues to grow, with the sector supporting over half a million Western Australians each year. The level of this growth and the complexity of the demand for services um, provides a lot of challenges for the leadership in the community services sector. And I want to start by touching on some of those issues, particularly related to the reform of community services. It's probably fair to say that those in the community services sector are experiencing some degree of reform fatigue, slightly differently to what we've heard from some of the business colleagues in the room today who've been calling for greater reform. It's no secret that for many years, significant changes to the funding, the regulation, the quality standards, the service models and the tax settings for not-for-profit organisations has had the close attention of successive governments at both the state and federal levels. The sector's been very clear that it is not the role for governments to be reforming us, but rather that we are seeking opportunities to work cooperatively with governments and other sectors to drive change, rather than passively accepting or implementing the agendas of others. But the reform environment is posing some really challenging and important questions, particularly what is the role of not-for-profit organisations in service markets? Should we be creating markets for consumers to purchase services and how, particularly when the funding is provided to individuals by governments? And what are the over-the-horizon consequences for civil society when we have increasingly market-based service models to meet social needs? Peak organisations like the Council are playing a key support role in community service organisations, particularly the small, regional and remote services, to help them understand and respond to the changes around them, to strengthen and sustain their future viability as voluntary organisations as part of our commitment to civil society. Let's turn now to the uh, economic landscape at the federal level. The recent federal landscape has been aided by a federal election campaign that's been very crowded with messages of high taxes, contributing to high costs, stressing the financial position of everyday Australians. But that's not an entirely accurate picture. Firstly, disposable income levels have been improving for most people. The wage price index, as you can see in this graph, continues to outstrip the national consumer price index. As our national peak, the Australian Council of Social Service points out in its submission to the Federal Government's National Commission of Audit, which we're hoping will soon report, while our structural deficit is very real, it's not only an issue of overspending. In fact, we have the third lowest level of spending as a proportion of GDP of all other OECD countries. The other issue is the declining and inadequate revenue base. Over the past year, Australians have had eight years, sorry, over the last decade, Australians have had eight years of successive tax cuts. Revenue from personal income tax has dropped from 12% to 10% of GDP. And superannuation tax concessions have almost doubled from 2.4% to 4.6% of GDP. It now represents the same value or cost to government as the aged pension. Other things like negative gearing and capital gains tax expenditure are also rising. 
This leaves us in a position where the federal government is struggling to afford to fund important social expenditure, like the National Disability Insurance Scheme, education, housing and welfare reform, to deliver a vital increase in the New Start allowance. It's not fair to suggest that we're in this position solely due to overspending. Equally, we need to consider the adequacy and the equity of government tax and revenue. While there are some real challenges out there in the economic climate, the reality is that the net position of the large majority of Australians and Western Australians continues to improve year on year. But the perception that costs are too high, taxes are too high, and governments are overspending and need to cut critical social programs continues to prevail. There are, of course, however, many people for whom the high cost of living is not a delusion or even a perception, but a lived reality. The Way Cost Cost of Living report shows that three of our four um, low-income household models are in a net negative position each week. So we say that we need a different public discourse about the cost of living in Australia, one that recognises our wealth and our privilege and balances our expectations for ever higher standards of living with our ability to ensure that everyone can enjoy at least the basics. Moving to the state economic landscape. WA is in still a very strong position. We're not at the top of the list of as many as those indicators as we were 12 months ago, but we're still doing very well and leading on retail sales. Where we're doing less well is in housing starts. This particular indicator is telling because our poor performance on housing is exactly the area we are failing the most vulnerable people in our community. The pressure on our social infrastructure from a rapidly growing population are very apparent. We're still 30,000 dwellings short of what our population growth requires. And unfortunately, in addition to underinvestment in critical areas like housing, there is some other important investment intended to ease some of these social infrastructure pressures, like the popularly promised Max Light Rail, which had been delayed due to the current fiscal constraints. Current investment in social housing, particularly through public-private partnerships, is delivering some great results. It's just not at the scale that the demand requires. These pressures are also being felt in our regional areas and large cities, as people are relocating to areas of higher economic activity. But we know that activity is easing in the resource sector as it shifts gradually from construction to production. This is also leading to a forecast increase in unemployment. We're predicted to see an extra 20,000 Western Australians out of work by the end of the next financial year, as well as a decline in the forecast revenues for the state, which I'm sure our Treasurer will touch on later in the panel. The state government has lost its AAA credit rating and is very focused on forecast revenue declines, not least from shrinking GST returns and its revenue is more volatile to international price movements due to an increasing dependency on royalties. The most recent state budget um, featured a fiscal action plan to, talk, uh, to, to plan our way through some of these challenges, and it detailed a range of policy and tax changes to raise revenue, which is very welcomed. Some of the policies were very sensible, particularly the change to the First Homeowners Grant, which is a encouraging construction and easing some of the inflation in the existing housing stock. Other decisions caused great concern, for example, imposing school fees on 457 visa holders or cuts to teachers' aides. Thankfully, the, uh, that has been reversed in terms of the 457 visa students. The, the plan outlines $350 million, save, uh, million dollars of savings and a further $370 million over the coming forward estimates through these program evaluation and rationalisation savings. These strategies are very important but they're not without their risks. And we've outlined four principles that you can see on the slides that are our recommendation for how you need to approach rationalising services. There must be an evidence base because otherwise there's a risk people will pick the low-hanging fruit that's easy to cut, not necessarily those services that aren't delivering the best results for the community. We've also called to make sure that there is a consultative process there, particularly to give community organisations a role in contributing to that evidence and analysis. Thirdly, there must be a responsible transition. If services are going to be consolidated or rationalised or closed, there needs to be lead-up time for people to plan for alternative ways to get care and support. 
And finally, and most importantly, whatever rationalisation happens, there needs to be a net growth in overall service levels to keep up with the growing population demands in our community. Currently in WA, we're falling a long way short of community demand, and the nature of the challenges being experienced are ever more complex. Each year, the Council consults with the community services sector and human service professionals across the public and private sectors as well. And overwhelmingly, we hear that the number one priority is access to affordable, appropriate and secure housing. We've suggested a range of investment priorities which will complement the state's affordable housing strategy by assisting people not just to move through the housing continuum, for example, from homelessness to crisis accommodation, but also to leapfrog key blockage points, to move from homelessness straight into a rental or to move from public housing into home ownership rather than a volatile private market. This approach creates greater stability and security for, to help people get back on their feet. It's very hard for them or the organisations working with them to deal with the other complexities in their life if they don't have stable accommodation. For a growing number of people in Western Australia, the long-term rental property in the public and private markets is becoming increasingly difficult. Over the past decade, for those on the minimum wage, the median rent in WA has gone from representing 35% of your income to 75% of your income. Perhaps one of the most telling reasons why people are struggling with the cost of living if they are on lo those low incomes. The dream of owning a home is also becoming the shrinking aspiration of the wealthy and the older. You can see there the stark decline in home ownership rates amongst the younger populations. But that said, even those who do have secure housing, there can sometimes be many other overlapping complex issues in their life that require a range of other supports. Our budget submission outlines the five areas that we would like to see a focus on in Western Australia. The sector is not just attentive to the growth in service levels, but the complexity of their clients' needs. People are experiencing multiple issues, trauma and challenges that defy a single ish response or solution from any one organisation. This complexity is a major driver of greater collaboration and support across organisations and sectors, but there are still many silos and policies that act as barriers to collaboration. The philanthropic and corporate sectors are increasingly looking for collective impact approaches and longer term social investment strategies. Social impact bonds are playing an interesting role in attracting new and creative resources and options, as well as focusing attention on measuring social return. But it's not just better coordination and new approaches to funding that are needed, but also a focus on the quality of the care and service models. With early intervention and a long-term commitment, there's a lot more we can be doing to improve outcomes in our community. The results have been in for the decades about the benefits of investing early. The earlier the investment in children, particularly those vulnerable are at risk, the higher the rates of return. We've seen some important investment in social housing, yes, but not close to the level of demand needed, given the tens of thousands of people, including children, who are in vulnerable accommodation or homeless and on waiting lists. We've also seen some very important and welcome investment in early childhood. But there's a strange absence of leadership to accompany it. The government's trying to foster greater collaboration between child protection, health, education and communities, but it would be great to see a vision for WA's children being championed at the highest levels of government. It's for this reason, if you can forgive a small plug, that the Council's hosting two world leading experts on early childhood this fortnight, and I recommend people who have an interest in early childhood development, which I know was an area people were very interested in when I spoke here last year, um, to, to see if you can catch one of those events. In summary, there's much that can be done to improve social service models and outcomes for people, but that change must be planned with the sector and not be a result of reform or funding cuts imposed on us. Housing affordability is the overwhelming priority and it cannot be resolved without greater levels of investment, but that's not just the responsibility of our state government. The federal government must continue to be funding the National Affordable Housing Agreement and homelessness services. And there's a role for greater contributions from the private sector as well. And finally, the complex social challenges in our community need early intervention and sustained support. We need to be investing early, particularly for vulnerable children and families with complex needs.
The risk for our community that we must avoid is not to develop compassion fatigue or to allow our capacity to care, to do more or to demand more of our elected representatives diminish. When issues like housing affordability, homelessness and poor outcomes for children go unattended and unresolved, the higher the levels of mistrust and judgment and discrimination and prejudice against some of the most vulnerable, particularly our Indigenous community. We begin to see the homeless, the refugees, the evicted tenants, the kids with behavioural issues as problems rather than people. We forget the injustices of the past and the way they still play out today. And we look away from the moral challenges of our time. I'd like to thank Cedar for not looking away and for you allowing me some time today to ask you to nurture your compassion, to help us to provide the care and support so desperately needed by so many people in our community. And I'd like to thank all the champions for justice out there in the community and urge you to keep shining the light. Thank you.